What is up? Welcome to the PFF Preview Podcast. For those of you really familiar with the PFF Podcast, this is usually Mike Renner giving you guys the intro to our preview podcast, but he's on suspension right now. He missed last week's podcast. We had to take a hard line. We suspended him for the intro and for one game preview, so it's only going to be myself, Steve Palazzolo, and, he, and Sam Monson here giving you guys the preview for the Tampa Bay Bucks and the Buffalo Bills. We'll bring Mike back in. After he serves his suspension, he's sitting here on mute yes, with us. Yes, that's the important thing about the suspension is he is sitting right here, as usual, next to us. He's just not allowed to speak. The fun part about this is he told us he had very strong takes about the Bills-Bucks game. Very yeah. strong takes that he just needs to get out there, but he's going to have to hold it in. Because uh, you make your own bed, Mike, I'm sorry. So, Sam, let's get right into it. Your uh, your Buffalo Bills here, Tyrod Taylor, super fan, hosting the Tampa Bay Bucks. Uh, what are you looking for here in this game? The Bills at 3-2 and two after a pretty solid start. Yeah, they're not my Buffalo Bills anymore. They were last year, oh, and sorry. that went badly. Um, now they're just the Bills. Um, I do like Tyrod, but I, I, I have no horse in the race when it comes to the Buffalo Bills this year. Sadly, my Super Bowl pick, the Oakland Raiders, are doing about as well as my Super Bowl pick last year did. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's that's all i got to say about that. Um, as for how they're going to get on this week, I, this it's an interesting game because the Bills have been a bit of a surprise team. They've right. been better than everyone thought they were going to be. Some of that is off the back of Tyrod. Of course, he did then throw the game away last week or the week before, whatever it was, against uh, Cincinnati. In the rainstorm. Yes, in the rainstorm. So we can kind of ignore that because, as we said earlier this week, all rainstorm games are a little bit funky. Um, but that defense in Buffalo has really been the story there. We This whole team looked like it was being blown up, rebuilt for 2018, presumably in a future without Tyrod Taylor. But the defense has been completely transformed just by going to that new defensive scheme, by shipping out the guys that didn't really fit it, by bringing in guys like Tredavious White at cornerback there, their number one rookie, who does fit this scheme, um, looks every bit a first-round pick, looks like an impressive zone corner. You're getting... Career years out of guys uh, like Jordan Poyer at safety. Um, this defense looks kind of interesting. And the Buccaneers are going to be without, I think, Jameis Winston, who was dealing with a banged-up shoulder, um, a sprained AC joint, I think, from last week's game. Doesn't look like he's going to go this weekend. Hasn't been testing the arm an awful lot. So either he's coming out there off the back of a week of not doing anything, or he's not going to be going out there at all, and you're going to get Ryan Fitzpatrick in the revenge game coming back to Buffalo, showing them what they're missing out on. Isn't every Fitzpatrick game a revenge yes. game yeah, at this yeah. point? He's going back to all of his previous stops um, and presumably losing to them. Yeah, so he had his usual kind of up-and-down game in relief in the Arizona Cardinals game last week, almost led the comeback. I think more concerning the Tampa Bay defense, uh, you know, Carson Palmer had an easy time of it last week, picking them apart. So, uh, you know, they need to bounce back. They have not been great. Vernon Hargraves, man. A little it's disappointed. Bad. A little disappointed in him so far at this point in his career. Um, does the Fitzpatrick playing, not playing, does that hinder or does that change your pick when you're looking at this game? I don't think so. I think I would lean Buffalo either way, but it certainly makes it a lot more conclusive. Yes. I think, you know, Buffalo against a Jameis Winston led Tampa Bay might be kind of close. Buffalo against a Ryan Fitzpatrick led Tampa Bay shouldn't be. I'm a little scared of the whole. Before the season, we thought Tampa Bay was a little better. Yeah, we did. We thought Buffalo was terrible. When does that start to revert back to it? Um, I do think the Jameis thing is pretty significant. Not, but Fitzpatrick has the ability to win yes, games in that's, this league. Well, that's the kind of scary thing is that Fitzpatrick and the YOLO style, coupled with Mike Evans and Deshaun Jackson, that could produce anything. Right. I mean, it could produce five interceptions, or it could produce a like an almost unstoppable game where he throws three touchdowns, 350 yards, and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's why it's worth watching. So. Um, everybody at PFF took Buffalo other Except than Neil. Neil Hornsby taking Tampa Bay. I don't know if he was going off injury report or lack thereof, uh, but he's the only one to take Tampa Bay. So Sam and I will both take Buffalo in this game on the strength of that defense continuing what they're doing. And Tyrod. And Tyrod, of course, in Buffalo. Uh, with that, we're going to bring Mike Renner back in. You know, in college football, a lot of times guys get suspended for... Uh, a, a series, a quarter, a half. You're live, Mike. You're unmuted. You're, you're back, Mike. What is up for all those people Whoa, who are too late? Uh, wow, yelling fast right at forwarding us. through the first uh, game preview because they didn't want to sit through Steve and Sam's monotonous tones. We're uh, we're back here. We're you got this is where you push play. So uh, 
Let's get right into the Panthers. Are traveling. we noting this down so we can put that on the show notes? Yes. So for those, put you, the number where I came in. People are going to want to skip yeah. right to for that. You I, winner fans. We're going to have to check the analytics and see when people really tuned into the show. I don't think our analytics go that deep, let's just be honest. Uh, Panthers travel to Chicago where they are a three-point favorite. It is Trubisky season in Chicago, although early returns on him... Not amazing. So he was he was solid last week. Very, very, very conservative game plan. Zach and I talked about it on the quarterback mm-hmm. podcast. Essentially, a bunch of rollouts, a lot of screens, two big-time throws when it mattered, though. Ooh, one in overtime to set up the game winner. Uh, and the touchdown that he threw, avoided pressure, nice pass on the run. So I thought last Sunday, more good than bad, but a very controlled effort for Trubisky. That's what we expected from him, though, isn't it? You know, it's what they did in preseason, got him on the move, did limited what they were asking to do. You know, the first week of his professional career was always going to be tough because he was going up against the Minnesota Vikings. What the PFF analytics say is the league's best defense right now. Oh. Uh, you can check those rankings out on ProFootballFocus.com. Best defense? The best defense in the NFL right now. Really? Um, so that was always going to be a tough ask. Last week was a little bit easier, and we saw him play a little bit better. So I, I, there's definitely something to like there, even if they are going to make things as easy as possible on him. Yeah, dude got thrown into the fire. He goes Vikings, Ravens, and now Panthers. Probably three arguably top ten defenses in the NFL right now that you get thrown into right away as a rookie quarterback. If he can go through this without being completely awful, I think that's a win for the Bears. That's a good sign for the Bears, at least going forward. And this, the Bears have been sneaky good? defensively according to your ranking sam yes Ooh. they have i think the third highest ranking in the nfl based on mm, a coverage wrong. unit that uh <laughs> a coverage unit that's been dramatically better <laughs> than we expected them to be you know guy, kyle fuller had the game of his career this past week and you know, guys like bryce callahan have played well adrian amos had a, a pick six won a great return on a touchdown amos and, is a good player yeah and they, they've the, the front seven is really good at stopping the run so if they can just add a bit of pass rush to that defense, it's going to be a really good unit. Yeah, add a bit of pass rush, though, is the biggest thing. What's going on with Leonard Floyd? Why is he not taking the step from his rookie year where he looked good down the stretch to now dominating his second year? Because people thought, you know, he might struggle right away. He's a little slight. Once he puts on some muscle, all of a sudden, you know, switch is going to flip. He's going to be that guy. I'm starting to have concerns generally with the slighter guys. Slider built. As I was a Barke- Barkevius Mingo super fan, mm-hmm. yes. and knowing knowing that he needed to probably add some bulk and all that stuff, I thought that he knew how to play the run well enough, and then as a pass rusher, I thought he just had enough burst and explosiveness to, to kind of get around it, and Floyd's not even as explosive as Mingo was, so I don't know. I'm not ready to write him off or anything, but maybe... I am. I, I didn't like him coming <laughs> out, so... Oh, I'm not, no, I'm not writing him off completely, but he's sort of who I thought he was coming out, and that he was... Good job, Mike. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's what, that's what I was looking for. Got, Sam, you want to say good job? I want to see more from Jonathan Bullard, <laughs> both against the run and rushing the passer, because I expected more out of him, too. Yeah, I know. I that 2016 know. draft class of theirs was it one that we liked, and it's been you know, just okay, hit or miss yeah. so far. Let's talk a little bit about the other side of the ball, though. Panthers, are they one of the top teams in the NFC right now? Sam? I mean, I they, they've so. looked an awful lot more like it if they managed to beat Philadelphia in True. that game. Um, Cam Newton, I think, was the big concern there because coming into that game, it looked like Cam Newton was back on track. He'd come through the ugly part of the first or the first part of the season that was ugly where they were kind of protecting him, ex- not exposing him to the big hits as part of that running game um, and letting him try and be this high-percentage pocket passer and it just wasn't working. Then they kind of unleashed him a little bit. You went back to the way Cam Newton used to play and everything looked good. Then he went up against Philadelphia, and it was a total train wreck. But he was going up against the league's best defensive front, I think, in Philadelphia. So it's tough to know how much of that was just Cam Newton going back in the tank and how much of that was that Philadelphia defensive front being as good as anything he's going to see this year, and it just proved too much for him to deal with. Yeah, some of those throws he was making down the field in that game just really bad. Don't even, don't even yes. know what he was looking at. Yeah, and when it counted the most, too, in the fourth quarter, just basically heaving it up for grabs at times. So I think defensively, I think they're a challenging team to go up against as far as the back seven and the way they mix up coverages. They usually make things challenging on opposing quarterbacks. I've had a concern about about their defensive front getting old the last few years, and they offset that by going and grabbing Julius Peppers this offseason. <laughs> yeah, getting a youthful player. <laughs> yeah. Getting younger. Their 2002, was it? First round, first overall pick. Yeah, anytime you can add a top ten pick, you know, you got to. Eight sacks. 
Eight sacks, sacks by the way. Now. Yeah, eight, oh, eight like, that's not the issue. Hey, yeah. Those those are those are the only pressures he had. But uh, yeah, so eight, eight sacks, sacks from sixteen total pressures. From sixteen total pressures, you know, Kwan Short still doing his disruptive thing in the middle. But you know, Charles Johnson's getting a little bit older. Uh, you know, they they drafted Vernon Butler a couple of years ago. I just think they need that continued. They just need youth on that well, defensive line, and they don't have it. And I think that's going to catch up to them. Well, the other thing they also need is Luke Keekley to be healthy. Um, back in back in the Keekley. concussion protocol. And the last two times, I think, that he's been concussed, they've been concussions that have lingered. They haven't been a case of, you know, you're out for a week, then you're back the next game, you got the concussion, now you're back in there. It's been a concussion that's kept him out for three, four weeks. It's, it's lingered. It's, it's the kind of thing that was happening when Austin Collie you know, scrambled yeah. his brain and ended up out of the league. Yeah, it's like the Wes Welker thing where you're kind of just like, dude, just don't go. Don't go back out there. And this, was with his, this was with his little neck contraption. Was he was completely to oblivious to that pull? That, it was just a regular power play. He looked like he wasn't ready for the pulling guard, and that's really rare for Keekly. He wasn't ready yeah. to take it on. The, when Brooks came. And yeah. Got, yeah. That, that one was, was just a weird play for him in general, I think. Anyway, <sighs> I have I, concerns about the defensive side of the ball, Carolina, especially with Keekly. Banged up. I still like Carolina in this game, though. You're not going to convince me that the Bears are sneaky good. Those Bears. Well, look, I think the big difference the is the they don't have the pass rush that the Eagles had. So yes. that pass yeah. rush put a huge amount of pressure on Cam Newton. It, it made him go back in the tank and start just heaving the ball around. Mm-hmm. The, the Bears aren't going to get that kind of pressure on him. So yeah, you know where this comes from? Better. Look, if you just look at our cumulative coverage grades, Bears are number five. Yeah. That's where it comes from. Because yeah. here's the thing. The coverage grade is essentially going to offset. If you, if you have a good coverage grade and a bad pass rush grade, which they do, mm-hmm. it means something's going right on the back end. Mm-hmm. And they deserve credit for that. Now, ultimately, you, the pass rush, you know, they should be working hand in hand. But if you're overcoming, not pressuring the quarterback and still doing the job on the back end, that is more impressive. Yeah. Don't sleep on the Bears in that back seven right now the okay. way they're playing. Okay. I'm not sleeping. I'm just saying. You can't convince me that they're better than the Panthers at this point, or that they'll win at home against the Panthers. Nice tank top, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, who are you guys picking? Sam, who do you have? No, I've got the Panthers, too. I picked the Bears. Okay. I think. Well, we'll uh, settle this one uh, come Sunday. All right, on to the Titans, who travel to the Browns. Titans are a six-point favorite in this one. Titans coming off a fairly big win over the Colts last Monday night. Is this the, time, is this the game, Sam, that the Browns actually get it done for you? No. No, it's not. I'm done with the brand. Finally, yeah. I'm done. You, you asked finally, the, wrong, no you asked the wrong question, Mike. Is Cody Kessler starting? No. Then it's not for Maybe. Second. Maybe I'll get back on the bandwagon when Kessler starts. Until then, I'm done with the well, brand. So what – explain – someone explain to me the thinking – behind benching Sean Kaiser for a singular game for Kevin Hogan. I, what, I get there, the idea like, of benching just, him. I don't like, think that was the plan. Yeah. Okay. I think Hogan was just that level of bad. Yeah, exactly. I was, but I was, so I was going to say, it's like, did you expect Hogan to not be that bad? So I Sam had a good so, theory. Yeah. Sam had a good theory last week. Okay. Sam can now say what I that theory was. The first theory. time. <laughs> yeah. So I think basically they've got this idea. They know they don't have a quarterback right now, or they're in the market. They're looking for a quarterback. They've rebuilt this roster. They're heading in the right direction. At some point, they've got to find a quarterback. So they're, they're giving like a five-game shot at every every person. Last year, Kessler got his five games. He didn't look like Russell Wilson, so we're done with Kessler, right? Yeah. Kaiser gets his five games to start this year. We saw five games Kaiser. It was pretty ugly. We're pretty sure Kaiser isn't Russell Wilson either. Okay. Kevin Hogan's been sitting there. He's done some decent things in limited snaps. Let's throw him out there, see what we have. I think the idea was to put Kevin Hogan out there for five okay. games, then move on to somebody else, only he was so bad that we're like, no, we're done with Kevin Hogan already. Let's go back to Kaiser. He's the only guy there that we think probably has something to work with over the rest of the season. Let's see what's there. Well, it's like I had a really nice plus 1.5 pass in my flag football game last week. Maybe you toss yeah. me out there next week. You got to You're always tape. talking about you and your uh, <laughs> athletic exploits. They haven't seen the tape. Right? <laughs> oh, that's me, Steve. You've got to send the tape to the Browns. Otherwise, how it are was you a really be nice able throw. to scout just, this? I didn't, no one was feeling Are me. you the starter? I might have to... We like uh, we have a platoon, a rotation. <laughs> yeah. Are you the athletic backup? I, I go and I play wide receiver for the Hail Marys. That's that's when I go play the jump balls. All right. Uh, enough <laughs> about me. A terrible league. Uh, <laughs> so I don't. I, uh, what I was going to say. I don't hate that theory by Sam. If you're looking for a quarterback, find a way to find you know to figure out who the quarterback is. I still think you need to see more of Deshaun Kaiser at some point anyway, though. Yeah, I, I do think that. The way he was going was not getting any better by him just going out there every week and holding out to the ball forever and taking sacks. I, I, I don't think it was you gotta figure it out improving, at some point. maybe sitting him down, giving him a week to reconsider 
uh, how he plays quarterback position might just maybe that wasn't was the worst. Maybe that was what it was. But I, I do, I do th- want I would like sort of an explanation from Hugh Jackson in terms of was it just like one game that was always the plan or did he actually think hey Kevin Hogan could be our guy you know right. That's no, good. It's a fair question. I'm more concerned with what the heck the rest of the team's doing. There's there's no progress on the rest of the team. That's the worst thing. Their drafts, like, you want to see some signs of promise. And you have Miles Garrett looking like what you thought Miles Garrett was. Maybe Larry Ogunjobi in limited time playing well. After that, but then, Sean Coleman at right tackle is okay. But, like, you drafted a ton of guys. For three of them to be making an impact over the last two years is... Like there are teams right now that have three from their rookie class making an imp- guys making more impact from the rookie class just this year that didn't have you know 30 draft picks. You're so. still seeing like Greg's, Greg Williams defense though. I mean it just seems mm, random Williams and defense. just not a good. De- it just doesn't seem like a good fit. Like, guys like Joe Schobert and Jamie Collins. Give give the stat, Mike. They're get blitzing almost 50 percent of the snaps. 50 percent. You said it was by it? far the most. In the, the NFL average is like 31. And they, they have one of the highest blitz rates rates and, and one of the lowest pressure, pressure rates. rates. And it's blitz like, is. Blitzes do lead to more pressures. They're not all quality pressures, but as far as actually moving the quarterback, they do work mm-hmm. more often, obviously. And uh, so that's bad. Yeah, so the there's a lot of issues for the Browns. Uh, Titans obviously have had their issues on the defense side of the ball, but I don't think it even matters in this yeah. one, to be honest. I get the Titans, too. Yep. Yeah. We all have the Titans. We all go Titans. All right, on to the Saints, who traveled to the Aaron rodgers list Packers where the Packers just have not ever stopped the Saints, it seems like, with Drew Brees at quarterback. They are averaging 38 points a game uh, going up against Dom Capers and the Green Bay Packers. Drew Brees is, do they have any chance of stopping him? Like, they've never stopped him in the past. Is this the game that somehow they do? No, I don't think so. I mean, Brees is is playing well, (laughs) spreading the ball around. Uh, You know, when you get uh, Teron Armstead back, Last week at left tackle, you know, one of the yes. more underrated left tackles in all of football. Solid player when he is when really he's healthy. Good left I mean, forget solid. I mean, he's yeah, he's, he's top a five. Left he's tackle. a top tier mm-hmm. left tackle when he's healthy. Uh, but the Saints' defense is is the story. All year we just kept saying get back toward average, get back toward average. The last three games, they've been average plus. They've been good. Yeah, average plus. How about that? So cool. the Saints, the Saints are a legit contender, sitting at three and two, a legit NFC contender. They all, they've always needed, so they've always run a defense that has been like so stressful on their cornerbacks in secondary. Like they ask them to do so much, but yet they've never had a defense that's actually had any talent in the back end until now. It seems like until they have Marshawn Lattimore, who I've said before is already a top ten cornerback in the NFL, and now Ken Crawley on the other side, well, actually, is playing well we for a second your player who was an undrafted free agent and that is they haven't even got delvin bro back yet if they get all three of those guys you're a big a fan sudden, of the, the the three elite corners mike all of a sudden that defense with paired with that offense they could make make some noise they're they're a team to make some noise they're also finding some players up front that is more than just cameron yes. jordan i don't know how it's been for before. Years. i don't know where he came from well greg robinson the greg robinson help Greg Ro- no, he went up against Greg Robinson. He had a couple Helps. games already that are career games in his. Yeah, David on Yamada playing some pretty good football. Trey, Trey Hendrickson, Hendrickson. Hendrickson, a guy we liked quite yeah. a bit coming out. God, I loved him coming out. He looks terrible. Like, <laughs> like he looks nothing like an NFL player should look when he's coming off the line of scrimmage. It's herky jerky. It. Those is, of you watching us on YouTube, that is what an <laughs> NFL player looks like. Thank right you. There. Yeah, it's very herky jerky, and it was not pretty but he was killing left tackles at uh f i a u it was f a u uh in college F-A-U. and it's translated for year one uh, right give us some stats steve on him i don't have a stat i was just pointing out that <laughs> david perry had played three snaps for them oh wow to sam that's all <laughs> okay but Carry on. stats are good. <laughs> he has five total pressures in 41 pass rushing snaps oh so those, are tri- those are your those are your that's what i was saying that. yeah Awkward. <laughs> How about that? Hey, what about so Green Bay? Ready? You got Brett Hundley. Needs better pocket presence. Uh, can't take so many sacks. The the question Zach and I posed, and Mike, you're pretty familiar with Mike McCarthy and how he likes to run that offense, right? The question Zach and I posed: Will they adjust the offense? Will it be less, you know, just ISO route quarterback go 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 win, mm-hmm. go find a wide receiver that's winning and make a great throw? Will they work around his skill set? Will there be more RPOs? What are they going to do 
to adjust. I got this sneaky feeling that we're going to see. I don't love Hundley as a player, but I feel like they can do some things with him and his skill set. No, uh, everyone has said uh, Mike McCarthy, famous for his stubbornness, his inability to adjust his offense, whatever. But I think this is such a drastic change going from Aaron Rodgers to a guy like Brett Hundley that he would be it would be a just criminal not to completely revamp the offense, not to just readjust, rethink everything about the offense with Brett Hundley in mind and what he brings to the table in terms of his skill set. I think you just have to utilize him as a running threat. He is a guy who ran a four six three forty at the combine. He is a fantastic athlete for the quarterback position. You have to use that as a weapon because everything's on the table right now in terms of ways to win offensively because you don't have a guy who can do it all on his own anymore. You have to they never they never tried to scheme to win with Aaron Rodgers. You have to scheme to win here with a backup quarterback. And I think in the past he's sort of done that. I mean, he got a big game out of Matt Flynn against the Lions. He got a big game out of Matt Flynn against the Cowboys a few years back uh, when they needed a win. So, But they kind of ran. But your point was this is a polar opposite to Aaron Rodgers, right? Yes. Tolzien, not that they're Aaron Rodgers at all, but they were well, not they a polar kept opposite, a similar. But just has a has a a skill set that you can utilize in, a, I gotcha. in addition. They kind of ran the same offense with Flynn and Tolzien, mm-hmm. though, for the most part. They are going to be in better shape, though, now they're getting their tackles back. You know, Bakhtiari back in there, Brian Balaga back in there. If they can get those guys healthy again and start getting back towards having one of the better offensive lines in the NFL as opposed to one of the worst ones, um, that's going to make life a lot easier for them. Quick name to watch in this one. Kenny Clark uh, made the team of the week last week. Interior defensive lineman for Green Bay. Last four weeks been one of the better players in the league monster game last week against minnesota their 2016 first round pick see if this is uh the turning point in his career because man he looked he's been looking really good the last few weeks yes all right uh, i still like the saints just because of what i said in the intro yep they don't stop i'm with you i took the saints yeah. that and bread on i like the saints to cover as well all right on to six points right on to the jaguars who travel to the colts they're favored by three and a half colts have looked all right offensively with Jacoby Brissett, but there's still it's still the Colts defense that we know and love, and they still crumble under any sort of opposition. Yeah, now he's going to get a ton of pressure because they're going up against the Jaguars defense, the Jaguars defense that is as good any, as anybody at getting pressure. They also have the best cornerback tandem in the league. Those two guys giving up a pass rating worse and just throwing the ball away every single play. Couple those thing, two things together, and it's going to be tricky to see how Jacoby Brissett can actually play well in this game. You know, he might have a, a play or two here and there, but over the course of a game, there's no way he can perform as well as he may. He, sh- he should need to, given what his defense is going to be giving up. Yeah, I think we've all agreed Brissett's looked pretty impressive for you know yeah. low expectations. Um, I'm not ready to jump. Monday night was funny. The typical. Twitter response, he got like two good throws early on and everybody's already concocting trades for him next year for top round picks yes. and stuff. And it's like, all right, that's a little much. Uh, Why did they spend the entire game talking about the fact that he was using a wrist coach as if it was some sort of newfangled idea that had never been used before? Well, it had to be something that was coming up in the production meetings. Yes. But you like, know, I don't not. listen to broadcasts, you guys know. Oh, they ben? spent the entire time, they're like, this guy's using a wrist They're pain. like, this, you have any idea what the plays are. you have are. any idea how hard this is for the play caller? He needs to find the play that he wants to call. Then find the number that that play is attached to. Call it in to the quarterback who's got to read that out to the rest of everybody. It's it's like, like Tom Brady uses a Chinese wristband? wristband. <laughs> yeah, Tom Brady, Ben Roethlisberger like two has a wristband. of the NFL is using QB wristbands. And they were acting like this was some sort of major flaw in the guy's like number seven. Ability. John Gruden himself used a quarterback wristband, didn't he not, as a coach? I mean, I either way, None of us it was just it was just a funny <laughs> yeah. it was just a funny I was 12, discussion. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, millennials, I, man. I, I I do think Jacoby Brissett has played a lot better than I would have expected him to coming in to a completely new offense and you yep. know having to use that wristband every yeah. play. Uh, that's just so hard, apparently. Huge but, drawback. Uh, <laughs> but still, you're going up against the Jaguars' defense in this one, and. You can be Tom Brady, and I don't think you're going to shred the Jaguars' defense with what they have, just at all levels. Wow, that. how things have changed. The way they're playing, the Jalen Ramsey was, and A.J. Boye how, on the like, back how, end. I think I said that, I may have said this before, but how like scarred were we by the Jaguars' past transgressions? Yeah, every year. That we thought that adding a top five defensive lineman in Clayus Campbell and a top ten cornerback, or top twenty cornerback in A.J. Boye, wasn't going to turn this defense they, into a It was easy to say Boye might have been good. a one-year yeah, one. Okay, the Boye they, just, they just 
they fooled us too many times. Yeah. And then this was the year we went, no, like, not again. We're not buying it until we see it. That's like any team that adds just that much talent over the course of one offseason. It's like, oh, yeah, maybe they might be pretty damn good. Well, especially <laughs> when they've done it two or three years in a row. Yeah. So you're only kind of – if 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 one of the previous years starts to come good after a season there, then you know that alone would help. Yeah. Colts defense, though, look, I, I thought they were a disaster coming into the year. Getting some sneaky good performances from the the many veterans that they threw with this thing, from Jonathan Hankins to Rashawn Melvin playing well right now at corner. Jabal Sheard has always been a pretty productive player. John Simon had that pick six the other night. So that's where I think the Colts are right now. Does the bubble burst on all of these guys who are kind of overachieving? Or they, or do you just give them a little bit of credit and say, hey, they've grabbed all these street free agents, mixed in a Malik Hooker in the draft who's shown a ton of promise that we expected on the back end. I just think they're kind of an interesting defense the way they've overachieved to this point, and I did pick them to win. It was an odd <laughs> strategy in, in that it would have made a lot more sense if they had Andrew Luck. And with this defense, you, this team would look a lot better on paper, I'd say. I mean, why would that change? All the, the only I mean, thing like, this is like the they, would, they would feel like Andrew Luck. Oh, record-wise. Yeah, record, like, oh, record-wise. You would. You'd be, this defense would get a lot more oh, yeah. if talk you, about you know, th- themselves. I am with so if this know. defense, which I thought was a disaster coming into the year, yeah. if they had overachieved like this, had Andrew Luck at the helm and snuck out a few more wins, which probably would have been the case. Yeah, that would be a much bigger story. Story of the league. Yes, yeah. not story of, but a story. Yeah. All right, but at, when it's all said and done, I think I still like the Jags in this one. I don't think I'm alone in this, but it looks no. like Steve. Steve is alone in this. Maybe going a different way. We got Indy at home, division game. Division games aren't always clear cut on paper. Trust in this indie defense. Okay. How many points are the indie defense going to need to keep Jacksonville to given the Jacksonville defense? This is going to be 16 to 13. 16 mm-hmm. to 13. Mm-hmm. I like it. I'm George Shahuri, joined by the one and only Eric Eager on behalf of the PFF Analytics Group. And uh, I said lock of the week last week. Lock is a little, uh, a little kind. Didn't quite lock it up there. What happened? Well, I think we we we've been harping on this situation all year, but we sort of ignored the fact that there was, you know, not a a twelve point difference in the quarterback play between Eli Manning and one Trevor Simeon. <laughs> and uh, so that was kind of we we looked at all the other things in that game and said this makes too much sense, and we ignored. The big, you know, we ignored the the, the, the big splinter in our eye uh, regarding what we've talked about the entire semester. What we've derided people for this entire season, uh, the 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 quarterback position. That's a great point and uh, wonderful biblical reference there. On top of it, I don't think, uh, you know, if you ask yourself what would Jesus do, he probably would not bet on a guy with the last name Simeon. So. Yeah. <laughs> with, with that being said, we've learned our lesson. We're moving on to greener pastures and a game that we've all been looking forward to, certainly since the schedule came out, traveling to the wonderful Foxborough area for the rematch of the Super Bowl. Falcons at Patriots. It's a three and a half point spread. And we like the Pats to make that cover happen. So before we get into uh, all the reasons why, we're going to quickly hit the two like things in the back of our head that are you know kind of making us worry a little bit. So number one thing that makes you worry just a tad bit, Eric, what is it? I think New England's defense, uh, you know, being the the weakest in the league in terms of giving up yards on a play for play basis. I think some of that's because they have the lead, um, but other times it's it's just because they're having difficulty covering, uh, as as our guys on the podcast have said, they've given up a lot of. They've given up a lot of coverage busts. They've had, uh, you know, they've had Stephon Gilmore, who's now injured, but he he's had a difficult transition, um, and then they've had difficulties getting to the passer. So um, I think all of those things, um, you know, make me a little bit worried because Matt Ryan, at his very best, can really shred up, de- you know, good defenses even. And so if he's going up against a bad defense, there is an opportunity that you know we see Matt Ryan play uh, at a level that he did a season ago. In which case, I think the Patriots are sort of in trouble. Um, you know, provided they don't have a quarterback on the other side, which they do. Thank you for uh, mentioning my point. I said one big thing you gave to mine was that Matt Ryan could all of a sudden turn back into MVP Matt Ryan. Um, 
the one stat that I think sticks out for me is last year he was dominant on deep throws, throws of 20 more yards downfield, 136.1 pass rating, was the best in the league. He was on target with 57% of those throws, which was just a couple of tenths uh, of a point behind Sam Bradford. Um, and so, you know, this year he's just plummeted back down uh, 20% accuracy rate on those throws, which is uh, last in the league. So if he even just like, you know, glances up a tiny bit, um, you know, that could that could really help the, the Falcons out. Of course, we don't think that's going to happen. There is a sizable difference in the quarterback play um so tell us about it why uh is tom brady so much better right now yeah i mean brady has some weapons now that he didn't have a season ago even when he was playing sort of outside of his mind you know he had brandon cooks on the outside uh who brought who has brought a speed element to the team that has helped you know lessen the impacts of a uh, the loss of julian edelman they also have rob gronkowski coming back so I just think his downfield throwing has been fantastic, uh, and that's probably why he's the highest-graded quarterback in the league uh, by quite a wide margin. Oh, that was good. You stuck to one point there. That's very nice. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, and I think what sticks out to me is when we look at – look, this this happened just a short while ago, this matchup, and if you laid out you know, the, the Patriots' offense and their – you know, their passing game in particular, even though I like their running game more now too. Um, and you said, look, you can have Brandon Cooks, Rob Gronkowski, you know, Danny Amendola, or you can have, you know, Julian Edelman, Danny Amendola, and Chris Hogan. I'd probably take that first bunch. I think Rob Gronkowski is a real difference maker and the Falcons don't have Eric Berry. So, um, you know, I think that'll be, you know, sort of the, the thing that pushes them over the top. And plus, it's it's at home. So, you know, what's the difference? It's a half-point difference for all of a sudden being able to play the game at home. I think that's, uh, that's a good bet. And the last thing that I'll mention is if it's all of a sudden a sort of close game in the fourth quarter, Eric, which, uh, which head coach do you want? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the, the, biggest, the biggest thing, too, is the fact that Bill Belichick uh, is a far better coach than Dan Quinn. And it might come down to even something, you know, if you look at like the over under for this game being 56, it might be one of those things where they try uh, to, to have it be, you know, last season was a Garrett Blunt type uh, game plan before his fumble. We might see like a Mike Gillis game plan, um, putting the, the Falcons into their base defense where their speed is less of an asset and more of a liability um, in there. So that, you know, we just never know, but we know, we do know that if, you know, if it comes down to, having to out scheme the other team um, I'm I'm gonna give some points to to uh, Bill Belichick's side as opposed to Dan Quinn's side as I think you probably would as well yeah yeah I mean so like Julio you know I was looking at at this earlier this week um, you know Julio's stat line in that game was kind of underwhelming but in order just to get that 87 yards and those four catches he had to make some of the best catches we saw all year i mean those were ridiculous and that one throw in the fourth quarter on the sideline that matt ryan made was you know unbelievable so it, it's a testament to how good belichick is at you know making the other team's best player work incredibly hard and be amazing just to do kind of average um so even though the you know the pats defense has been pretty bad um i think you know most of that came at the first kind of three games of the season has been a little better since then, but um, you know, hopefully they can hold Julio kind of at bay in this one. So that's our lock Patriots minus three and a half over the Falcons. When we talk to you next week, hopefully we'll be a little more uh, excited on the intro because of the victory. If you want some more before we get to that point, our best five picks, our best bets, column is up on profootballfocus.com um, if you don't want to read my terrible writing and want all the picks anyways you can head to um, the website and get yourself a pff elite subscription uh, it's 200 dollars, eric but it's the best 200 dollars you're you're going to spend all year so agreed make it happen um, we will see you guys next week good luck back to the guys lock it up you lock it up all right on to the cardinals who travel to L.A. to face the Rams. Rams are three-and-a-half-point favorites in this one. 
They were coming off a pretty big win where they traveled across the country to face the Jaguars and took it home. Sam, break this one down for us. Well, this is a London game, isn't it? This is two teams flying a long way. Because we're not just going across the country. We're going across the country and an ocean. I'm terrible at this. Pretty sure this is a London (laughs) game. Steve told me it was anyway. So if it isn't, it's his fault. Do we have a London game? This is bad podcasting as we look up. Stadium. Twickenham. There you go. Where's it's a that? London game. It's the yeah. rugby stadium in, in London. It looks like it's in Twickenham. Yeah, there you go. So it is a London game. Yeah. So long way for both these teams to go. That's that's obviously the first point to make. Okay. Um, I I honestly don't know what to make about both these two teams. I think they've they've both flashed good things. They both flashed bad things. The Rams, you know, we thought Jared Goff was taking these huge strides forward. Really, we might just seeing the the we might just be seeing. The product of Sean McVay, the kind of the effect he has on a quarterback, and we haven't seen that much development from Goff himself. We're just seeing a lot more easy opportunities for him to make plays. We are seeing improved offensive line play. You know, Andrew Whitworth has obviously been a colossal upgrade on Greg Robinson. So Todd Gurley looks better, you know, because there's actual space there to run behind. Um, I just don't know how much Goff has actually improved. Um, and that's a big thing because this offense needs to get better over the course of the year and not just what we've seen from the first couple of weeks. You know, the Cardinals, I don't know how impressive Adrian Peterson is going to look this week because a lot of that was on the back of some, like, the best performance of Jabrain Gresham's life as a blocker. There's no way that's happening two weeks running. Right. So Adrian Peterson is going to have some more some more tricky holes to find because it's not going to be as good a a run blocking situation he's got last week what's that going to look like when it kind of evens out over the rest of the season i think this is an interesting game that was just so you kind of dropped a low-key really hot take there saying that jerry goff really hasn't improved since last season i think he's improved but i don't know how much i think a lot when we started this season he was he had a couple of really hot games Mm -hmm. i think we were saying you know, there's McVeigh come in. We've got some improved weapons, the offensive line, and then this huge step forward from Jared Goff as well because of all this. I think they just ran into Seattle and Jacksonville the last yes, two weeks. That's, that's what I was gonna say. Like you, that's the point. You leave Jacksonville without an interception, it's like you probably did pretty well. Like even though he didn't pass for that many yards, they didn't yeah, or you ask just, him to drop back. Or you just times. avoid you it. Think, doing you think Jacksonville's the 85 Bears? <laughs> they're damn good. It's a damn good defense. I, I mean, they're carrying a Blake Bortles led offense. So I'm, look, I think Goff. Goff is is what he was a few weeks ago when the stats were crazy. The stats have come back down to earth. We gave a little, well, actually, a few weeks ago about Goff, but and we and we kind of gave that caveat too. The stats are a little bit ahead of his grades right now. It's all starting to even off against those better teams. Yeah, I'm just saying. I don't know. I, I think the the development that everyone was giving him credit for it was a bit overstated to begin with. And Perhaps I think now we're starting to move that percentage a little more towards the the other things that have changed. The coach, the scheme. The, the weapons and the offensive line, and actually Jared Goff hasn't been that much better. Any concern that Aaron Donald is all of the Rams' defense? He is the entire, yes, oh, all of the of production, all of the production coming from the Rams' defense is essentially coming from Aaron Donald. I have a lot of concern about that. This is not the same defense that you know they were a few years ago. Uh, it's not the same defensive line. I, I think they just uh, Robert Quinn taking a step back, losing. Uh, William Hayes uh, at defensive end. They've just underrated lost. Lo- yeah, game. underrated. Like they've just lost too much talent from that defensive front to still be considered. You know, they used to just tear up the NFC West every every single game. The opposing offensive line had no chance. That's. I mean, it's still a good one. It, like, when you have Aaron Donald, you're still going to get a lot of pressure, but it's not that. Oh boy, you have to account for it snap after snap. Well, they the haven't team. had any additional. Um, pass rush on the defensive line it's all been donald donald has 20 total pressures over the past two weeks he's had 10 in each of the past two games um robert quinn hasn't played this season at all there's nobody there bringing additional pressure on the line i think michael brockers has the second most total pressures on that defensive line and he's basically a nose tackle um they've had to blitz their linebackers a lot more to try and bring up some of that pressure part of that is wade phillips going there as a defensive coordinator so i think you're going to see an uptick in blitz percentage anyway you're going to see him get a bit more um a bit more out of those linebackers the stand-up linebackers um and it's just there isn't that kind of pass rush there well and Truman johnson looks like he's playing his way uh, out of the franchise tag after this season and out of any big long-term contract he's given up 380 yards already on the season that's too many 
That's <laughs> yeah, officially too many. That's my that's my. What does that analysis. translate to over the course of the season, Steve? You wanna? Well, it's, uh, that we're we're 37.5 percent of the way mm-hmm. through the season, so it's uh, over a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> that's close. It's 960. It is. Yeah, I did. I did that. It's math. under a thousand. Under just under. 960 is under a thousand. It's still a lot. It though. is. That's uh, still a lot of yards. Arizona on the other side. Marcus Golden out for the season. Obviously, Calais Campbell off to Jacksonville. Chandler Jones, the only real pass rush threat left over there. That's a big concern for their D as well. I said it going into to this season that the Calais Campbell was the linchpin to that front seven because of all he did. And he uh, he is the ultimate stunt weapon. And the Cardinals love to run their blitzes, r- love to run their stunts. And he freed up Chandler Jones, Marcus Golden so many times a season ago to allow them to get those sacks. And they don't have that guy anymore. It, it just don't have that guy. I got blinded by the versatility of all of their players mm-hmm. that just sometimes losing that star in the middle you know, goes unnoticed. He was the one guy. I mean, they had a bunch of players hitting free agency at the same time last offseason. He was the one guy I thought that they couldn't afford to let go. You know, If you were going to lose one of them um, or even two of them, he was the one guy I think you needed to retain. The concern, I guess, from their point of view is that he was, what, 31 heading into this season. He's getting to the point where you have to be concerned about him being able to maintain that level of play for too long. Certainly it looks this season that at the very least there there's going to be a season of awesome play before any kind of decline starts to hit. But you can at least see why they would have been reluctant to to break the bank with a monster contract to keep him around. But it, it's definitely the thing that's hurting the most is losing him from that defense. And then they haven't had uh, Kem Dietschy for a good portion of the season. Who he was? I think they let him go because they're like, yeah, Kem Dietschy is going to be all of a sudden guy, be that yeah. guy. And without him, like I said, they don't have that guy. So. Who you got in this one, Sam? Uh, I think I went with the Rams. I did indeed, Steve. I think I took Arizona. I did. I took Arizona. Got any hot reason for that, or just you yeah? Know? I think you, you get this hot and cold Carson Palmer, and uh, look, yeah, looks good for the most part. It's hot. Uh, hot and cold Carson Palmer. I'm still I still have some questions about the Rams' offense over the, after the last couple weeks, and I you know uh, maybe Arizona have they turned the corner with that offensive line, or was it just going up? Against the Bucks. I was gonna say, like, do you think they ever block Aaron Donald in this one? Does like he ever get blocked cleanly? No, but he's the he's the one man show though. Yeah, like he's the only play, guy. Though. It's gonna be every single. He's play. the only no. guy. All right, Arizona. yeah, I'm gonna go with the Rams with a W. I'm gonna go with them to cover too. Three and a half point spread. I like that. Uh, On to the Jets who travel to Miami to face the Dolphins. Dolphins three point favorites. Uh, obviously, I'm picking the Dolphins in this one. Uh, I don't pick the Jets. <laughs> I don't know how they're three and two. Uh, three and three now. They're, they're locked three in. Three. Excuse me, sorry. Locked they're in as almost a, four and two. Someone uh, wasn't that close. Explain how they're three and three. Give me like a cliff notes on what played the Browns. What happened? Like, yes. Okay. Played the Dolphins. Yeah. They have played some bad teams. They they have also been better than everyone was thinking know. they were going to be. Though. Like I, Josh McCown, is he? franchise guy <laughs> is no. that the quarterback of the future but he's there are, okay i mean uh, josh mccown was terrible before now josh mccown has been okay for most of the season this huh? is going as badly as you could possibly expect for the jets this year <laughs> you're starting a guy like josh mccown who you know is not your franchise quarterback you know yeah, but uh, he's capable of good but play. he's playing out of his mind this is, no he's not out of this is the, this I, is I was the saying thing, like though. but you're getting a terrible draft yeah the pick. tank job oh, is going by it's like your draft pick is not going to be nearly as bad as you thought it would be is this weird there are two games this week that will now be the second division matchup jets dolphins redskins eagles and we're in week seven the division they're done yeah some of the divisional matchups are crazy i I mentioned the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta schedule, one, right? How they play all Everybody six games the in the end. last eight weeks of the season. Yeah, so like when you're going back through, the Jets have only played six games. One of them was against the Dolphins, and now they're playing the Dolphins again. Yeah. That's a very like that's that rare. That turnaround is they NFL look into that stuff. Dolphins completely laid a dud. dud. I'm in this whole like are Dolphins you, are, are you a roller coaster. Just for video right now, is this oh, no. posing? I'm on the worst. I'm on the worst for... stool here. Yeah. <laughs> I did this last week. You, I like to stand stool up. has padding. I'm gonna my, do the rest of this with my head cut off. My the, stool uh, is just wood. This, this is yeah. awful. This that's, is the, <laughs> that's the high stool that Sam that's needs. That's the stool that I have to sit on every Monday to avoid me looking like a foot and a half shorter than Steve. Uh, this is fantastic podcast. A little inside baseball for well actually fans. Sam is on a much higher stool. 
than I am. And now between Steve looming beside me and then standing up at periods in the podcast and Mike doing like squats next to his uncomfortable stool, this My entire podcast numb. appears designed to make me look like I'm four foot five in the middle. All right. You guys need to check out the YouTube version of this just to see how we're <laughs> aligned. All right. Back to the game uh, where the Jets are taking on the Dolphins. <laughs> um, let's, let's go to the other side of the ball. And Miami... They're above 500 also. They are not a bad team. <laughs> like they've well, they have at least expectations a reasonable as well. Front. William Hayes. And I was going to say, where are they? How are, how are they doing this, Sam? Well, they have a decent defensive front. Mm-hmm. Cameron Wake remains freaky. Um, he is, God, he is. He's always been one of the best pure pass rushers in the NFL. But he, he's been good enough that he's able to do it against good players. You know, a lot of guys can beat up against really bad offensive tackles and rack up huge amounts of pressure. But Cameron Wake has been good enough to do that against good players and, and get a consistent amount of pressure against guys that should be able to take him or at least moderately out of the game. He still gets pressure against them. Sue's been good. William Hayes is this perennially <laughs> excellent player that just doesn't get any credit for it. Um, huge offseason addition. And Lawrence Timmons looks reborn in a, a scheme that doesn't ask him to do crazy stuff like covering Odell Beckham Jr. on a 50-yard crosser deep down the <laughs> field. Suddenly you put him in like a regular scheme, and Lawrence Timmons isn't quite done. So I think this defense, I mean, the coverage on the back end is obviously still a question mark, um, especially sitting down Byron Maxwell. But I, I think that the front seven is actually a pretty good unit. Yeah, they finally, and I think the biggest improvement for them has been on run defense. In the years past, you could just roll through that front uh, four because they were so aggressive and so hyper-aggressive getting up the field. You could get those guys out of their gaps, trap them and whatnot. But William Hayes, legitimately one of the most underrated players in the NFL over the past five yeah. years. He has probably been the biggest difference, difference on that defense because they went from guys like uh, Mario Williams last year and Andre Branch who weren't run good run defenders to now a guy who is one of the best in the, at the position in the NFL at defending the run and soft edges in the run game are bad for your entire run defense. That affects more than just you on the defensive line that affects the linebackers, how they feel, how the safeties feel. William Hayes is much better. It's just such a big improvement that it, I think it's had a ripple effect through that entire defense. William Hayes, MVP. Because if the Rams, yeah, I was say, am I talking uh, de- the Rams? MVP here? The Rams defense has taken a step back. The Dolphins look look much better across the board up front. Uh, Charles Harris starting to show some of that pass rush ability that he was drafted for over the last three weeks. So they're starting to come together. Uh, they are very reliant on the front seven, though. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much Lawrence T- Timmons can keep it up. The back seven you already mentioned, Xavier Howard having that. Uh, we thought he was a, a boomer bust type of prospect, right? You were like, some some plays he looks like Richard Sherman. Other plays he looks like he's never played corner in his life. He's on the bottom of the roller coaster right now. So there's still questions on the back seven, but that defensive front feels like they're going to be in every game because of them. So that's yeah. where I am. And I think in this game they will be not just in it, that they will win it against the Jets. Ooh. Steve, who do you got going this one? Well, I got Miami. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Jets the Jets should be overmatched by every team every week. Uh, credit to them for, for playing a little above their skis for much of the year. And, uh, look, Josh McCown is a guy that can go out and win games for you. You just, you just don't trust him over time. We're still in small sample size world yeah. with McCown. That's what I'm... Sam? That's where I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm going with the uh, Dolphins as well. I just don't trust this Jets team. I don't actually understand how they're winning games. Yeah, I was gonna almost say. nobody is grading well. <laughs> There's no reason they should be winning football games. Uh, yeah, I like I said, every week I will be picking against the Jets, uh, even on their bye week. So The, uh, the Jay Ajayi bet update, by the way, oh. is razor close. It's He has a run grade right now of 89.0. And last season, his run grade was 88.9. Mm-hmm. So by 0.1 <laughs> of a percentage what? point, I am winning the bet. No, no you're winning the bet I'm by 0.1 bet. percentage point. Gonna be it's right on there. Boom. All right. Offensive line still terrible. A Jaya still, still a monster. On to the Ravens, who traveled to Minnesota to face the Vikings. Uh, Vikings quarterback position, uh, going to be Keenum, uh, because Sam Bradford's still okay, but still going to be okay riding the pines. Uh, Vikings favored by 5.5 in this one. Sam, break down your boys for us. Well, he really wasn't okay when he last got on the field. That was beyond not okay. Miserable. That looked That's horrendous. Back down to earth for Keenum. That was just back down to earth. Yeah. No. I mean, Keenum was playing com- ridiculously well, completely unsustainable. Finally, we saw real case Keenum come out, and that wasn't pretty. Um, Teddy Bridgewater has been activated. I mean, he's not going to play in this game, but he's suddenly becoming a factor at quarterback for the Vikings again. 
at some point this season they're going to actually get him on the field, you would think, because it's sounding like Sam Bradford is, you know, like properly broken, not just regular kind of yeah. something's wrong with Sam Bradford as it usually is. When we were talking, this might actually shut him down long term. Um, and Case Keenum is going to, there's going to be more games like last week for Case Keenum that are going to make you want to put Teddy Bridgewater on the field. Plus, you've got to get the idea of we actually need to find out what Teddy Bridgewater is at some point this year before we have to deal with contract situations and that kind of thing. Um, This Vikings team, though, it's set up pretty well for a quarterback not to have to do that much. You know, it's got a really good group of receivers, though Stephon Diggs is dealing with a groin injury, which could be a major thing if he's not in there. Um, There's a lot of guys on their injury report. Quite the injury report that I'm looking at right here. Stephon Diggs is the big one, though. He's right. got he's a groin injury. It's not supposed to be seri- as serious as the last one he had, but it's the kind of thing that tends to keep a receiver out for a few weeks. Um, you know, groin is a specific muscle group to receivers that tends to be important. If that's not 100%, you can't cut. You can't do any of the things that makes him such a great receiver. Um, so I think that's a real key injury to watch heading into this game. If they do have Stephon Diggs, they can get something going against this Baltimore Ravens team without expecting Case Keenum to win the game for them. If they don't have digs, I think they're in trouble because that Ravens defense is good enough at all levels that, that they're going to struggle to to get too much going. And then it's going to come down to what that Vikings defense can do against Baltimore, which again should be advantage defense, and you end up with this low-scoring, relatively ugly-looking game. Another I, yeah, I was going to say, do the, do the Ravens score? <laughs> do the Ravens score in this one? Yeah, I think it's going to be tough. That are, o- that offense. Are I the mean, Ravens the worst offense in football right now? Honestly, Miami's up there. Yeah, Miami is up there. Miami is up there the way uh, they've been playing. Uh, we, you know, Flacco doesn't have a ton of weapons to throw to. Even if he does, he's just not the same guy the last couple of years. He's not even aggressive. You know, this showed up on film all last year. He's not even aggressive at times where he needs to be aggressive in trying to drive the ball down the field. He's not even throwing his underthrown pass interference. I know. It's that we need from him. At what point did the team start to like question his position? It just seems like no matter how bad Flacco plays, he's the unquestioned starter, and no, they're not even sort of talking about the future. There, it's just Flacco's team. This is Joe Flacco's our quarterback. Like at what point do you say, "Hang on, how bad can he play before we start to look for a new quarterback?" It's a good question. I might, and I mean, they really haven't do like, it? addressed you, it whatsoever. Like, can you be objective? Like, and they don't even have like a guy in yeah. the works to develop. Like they had Ryan Mallett, who is not <laughs> <laughs> like they're they're not even a small. They're not even taking like a, a flyer on a guy in the fourth round. Yeah, yeah. Type and of we say investment. this all. The, so now, I, because they have so much locked up in Flacco, do they have to use every pick to build around him? Or the thing that we say every year, like even if you have Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Drew Brees, and you know they're some of them getting old, but. You always want to develop that number two guy, and at worst case, you, you flip, flip him and you you get more draft picks. But if you have a Flacco, I would also be like, oh, just in case he's better than Flacco as well, mm-hmm. bring another guy. But in. also, the cap has been going up. Like that contract isn't as as no, crippling right. as it it's was. Not, when it's he not. It's not bad. It. Like it's been getting better since he signed it. You're absolutely at the right. Time where he's been getting worse, and they they don't appear to have done anything to even consider the future. Like even just what happens if he goes down. Never mind, you know, the fact that he's playing terribly. There's no kind of backup plan there in Baltimore at all. It's it's not good right now for, for the Ravens. They don't look they don't look like a playoff team. They don't look like they are built for winning football yeah, games. Like any like they don't look like they'll be a Super Bowl contender in any sort of you know next year or the year. They just look like they're they're a little behind the eight ball right now. I'll just say yeah. Alex Collins looking pretty good running the ball the last few weeks. That's finding the, uh, a home. That's the Irish dancing. You see that. I didn't see his Alex accent. Collins apparently loves a bit of Irish dancing. Really? Yeah. Mm. That's how he does his He's footwork. He's the only one. That's how he works <laughs> in his footwork. Yeah, I don't. Not, We've got some it. in our family with the uh, the in-laws like to do that. Oh, really? Kelly's in uh, Kelly's in-laws, I think, or her, somewhere in her, her family. Oof. It's a little weird. Enough. That's a little weird. Family parties get a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. All right, I'm picking the Vikings in this one, I think. Hey, we all are. We all are picking the Vikings Gordon in this Gordon's picking the Ravens. Oh, Gordon. Mm. I love the PFF well, picks this been. week. There's a lot of just rogue, one-off <laughs> picks. People are trying to claw back. Yeah, trying to claw back games <laughs> on everyone else, and it just spirals out of control. Not Mike, it. how'd you do last week with your picks? Oh, my picks, they were the best of any national NFL analyst. Thanks for asking, Steve. All right, on to the <laughs> Cowboys, who maybe maybe should take every week off where I don't get on the podcast. My picks will You're still three more. games behind me. Okay, we didn't have to bring that up. You had up. more time uh, to study with your <laughs> missing yeah, the podcast? I was just pouring over 
uh, instead of doing the <laughs> podcast. On to the Cowboys, who are a six-point favorite, traveling to San Francisco, who's still looking for that elusive win. And I think they're still going to be looking for it after this week. We're all taking the Cowboys? Yeah. Is anybody going to care if we don't put too much analysis into it? Steve, you don't have to. Uh, every, week, <laughs> watch, every week, watch the Forrest Buckner. Steve, Bobby is listening to this podcast in tears right now. Yeah, he's looking for any way he can exploit the Cowboys. He's looking I for think some insight from us on what to exploit And you're giving him nothing. Dallas. Nothing. Left guard. Go get left yeah. guard. Just put two guys over the left guard. That's all you got to do. Like it, it has been ugly for the 49ers, but they have lost games by what? Three points here, two points here, three points. They've been competitive. One point. Very two competitive. Two points. Like they, they have been razor sharp on every single game in terms of the, the loss differential in, since week one where they got pretty much stomped. All right. One thing I did want to talk about, though, with this game is it – should we be worried about Solomon Thomas? He like, just had a great game. Legitimately worried. Legitimately He's worried now. Had the most snaps of any edge rusher, not grading well, and it's like edge rusher is usually a position where guys fire off pretty strong their rookie years if they're going to be game changers at the position. He's we had, haven't seen a lot of guys not come out as rookies being effective. He's had two good games in the last three. Okay, one of them was against the Arizona Cardinals offensive line, which is going to help, but. The last one was against Washington. He tore them apart in the run game. Had five defensive stops was consistently in the backfield. Yeah, I drafted I, a guy top three for his run defense. Well, that's what I thought he was coming out, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had Not a top below. three. Well, I mean, he went top three is what I'm saying. I but know, like, but, but we thought... Some of our guys thought he was top three mm-hmm. caliber. I was a little concerned about what's he going to do as a pass rusher on the edge. Now, when he does kick inside, he's still effective, and I think he can be effective. But I thought we were looking at this elite edge run stopper which isn't a first round value that could develop as a pass rusher. i'm not i think he's that's about where, where he should be yeah i think that's where he needs to be as a pass rusher he needs to be inside rushing the passer i don't think you can put him on the edge and expect him to win on the outside with speed that's not going to happen so you know i don't think you can judge him on that and say that you know that isn't there because i don't think anybody really expected him to be that guy i think what you need is you get him setting the edge in the run game on the outside if you're going to play him out there like William Hayes um, and then you kick him inside like Michael Bennett in Seattle and that's where he does his damage as a pass rusher beats up interior players with speed and quickness and I think he can do that but I'm not I wouldn't be concerned about him with the the last couple of games he's had but it's the thing is like you drafted him top five because you thought he would be a difference maker you don't draft a guy top five if you think he's going to be a very good run defender and Solid as a passer. You I, want impact yeah, but, pass well, look at rushing. DeForest Buckner last year. DeForest Buckner was just okay last year, pretty good. This is the season we're now seeing him start to kick on and te- tear people apart. We have over about 250 snaps so far out of his 354 are straight up that nine technique. Yeah, he's playing you know, wide. Yeah. Wide. I mean, so again, and if you read our scouting report, we're comparing him to Michael Bennett and that yeah. style and kick him inside and. You know, early, he's an I early he down outside technique. Player. Yeah, I thought he was just yeah. a pure all the way yeah. every down. But I'd even as a three, three he's kind of undersized or whatever. But he's so technically sound, like he is yeah. unbelievable against the run. So I mean, if you did draft him expecting Von Miller, Khalil Mack, Miles Garrett type of edge production as a pass rusher in that role, mm-hmm. I think you just misevaluated him. But that's and then that goes back to again though why I'm worried. It's like they have two of those guys. They have Eric Armstead and DeForest Buckner. He's like. Uh, Yes, I would love to see him play more three technique, but realistically, he's not going to be with the other guys they have on that team. So it's like when, when you're going to get the most value out of him. I like I just don't know when the 49ers all of a sudden. Well, that was, he, that's what I'm just saying. That oh, was, I get it. Awesome. I understand. That was the question mark coming into this year. It was how are you going to get those three yeah. guys on the field at the same time because they all essentially play the same position. Um, and it is a struggle because at the moment you put Solomon Thomas as your wide guy, and that's how they're doing it, by basically shoehorning one of them into a position he shouldn't really be playing. But I think as long as he does okay at that position, it's not a concern. It's just you're not seeing the best we could out of him. Mm-hmm. So at some point, hopefully, they will put him in the position to, to best succeed and to best realize his potential. But I don't think you get, you know, I don't, I don't think we're worried about him becoming a bust until that happens. Okay. All right. Good combo. All right, we're all picking the Cowboys. On to the Bengals, who travel to the Steelers. Steelers, five-and-a-half-point favorites in this one. Steelers coming off that big win where they upset the Chiefs. Bengals coming off a bye week, though, in this AFC North matchup. Steve, who are you giving the edge to? Well, I like Pittsburgh better as a team. And, you know, I think you have to give 
credit to Cincinnati for you know what looked like it could have been a lost season, being able to bounce back. And uh, did you pull out the Andy Dalton number yeah. for me this week? Yeah, uh, to his pass or average time to throw went down from 2.54 seconds to 2.24 seconds since they changed. They made the change in coaching. That's right. We talked about it on the review pod, I think, or one yeah. of the pods where I cryptically said I think the play calling has been better, right? Mm-hmm. Since since the new move, uh, you know, defensively. I, so I was doing a NFL.com fantasy draft before the season, and the Bengals were one of the top fantasy defenses based off uh, when I was using our PFF Elite rankings. And I actually hadn't done a ton of research to that point. And I saw the Bengals really high, and then here they are in the season, getting after the quarterback like crazy and playing really good defensively. So my just shout out to PFF Elite for kind of highlighting for me that this Bengals offense defense might be a little bit better than expected. They've been a solid unit across the board. Guys like Carl Lawson really stepping up as a rookie and, uh, you know, credit Cincinnati, but the way Pittsburgh's defense is playing right now, keeping them in games, I think it's a matter of time before their offense starts to hit their stride. When Cincinnati on third downs can rush the passer with Carlos Dunlap, Geno Atkins, Carl Lawson, and either Michael Johnson or Chris Smith on the interior, that might be... If not, the, it's a top three sort of defensive front four in terms of attacking the passer, it just and has been in terms of the production they've garnered because of how good Lawson's been as a rookie and because of how dominant Atkins and Dunlap are. All of a sudden, like when you get Michael Johnson out, off the edge and kick him inside, he's a little bit more productive as a pass rusher, and that, they've been killing. They've been getting to every quarterback they face this year, basically, and that's been fueling that defense. So. Yeah, and that's something they've needed for a while. Yeah, it's a you know it's a four man rush type of zone heavy defense that that needs that. So yeah, who would have thought Carl Lawson would be good? We had no idea. <laughs> yeah, ranking him as first rounder, fourth rounder, crazy. No, but I, I actually think the Bengals win this one because I love what that offense has been since they made the change. I think the quick passing game can not at least not exploit necessarily the Steelers defense but is an effective way to attack it. It's not going to, I don't see Andy Dalton throwing the game away uh, with what the Steelers bring to the table defensively and their offensive game plan. So I think this one will be a low-scoring one. I think it will be close, and I think the Bengals come away with it. Steelers, 10% man coverage yeah, in your article this week? 10 point something percent, which is less than oh, half damn. of the next lowest team. The next lowest team is over 20% in terms of how much man coverage they run. They've played the worst slate of quarterbacks i think of any team in the nfl so far. i was i was going to ask you that so a couple last week i said look the steelers play some funky defense as far as the stunting the blitzing a lot of stuff that they do they're getting good play from cameron hayward and stefan to up front i mean they've got some players playing ryan shazier is playing maybe the best football of his career even though he looks completely lost sometimes he just he's ryan shazier that's what he does but do you believe in the pittsburgh defense it's no, like, not like that. I don't. Not, I have like, I have I trouble still, like completely buying in to Pittsburgh's day. Here are the quarterbacks they've played: Deshaun Kaiser, then Case Keenum on a short week, who didn't know he was starting when Sam Bradford went out, then Mike Lennon, Joe Flacco, Blake Bortles, and then Alex Smith. And they shut down Alex Smith pretty well, but he missed a handful of throws down the field that were fairly wide open. I mean, there was a but coverage bust that would have yes. won the game yeah. for Kansas City. That was just he wide was. open. And he threw it into the into the crowd. So, so they've really taking advantage of some bad opposition. I th- that's why I'm saying I think the Bengals could move the ball against this team. You yeah, know, I, I could see it. I, look, I, this is one of those like teams are trending I think that five and a half point deal. spread is at least crazily high. All right, so I took Pittsburgh, but I could see like you're saying teams are trending, Cincinnati's trending in the right direction, and they're, they're not as bad as maybe their record might show. The one thing I think that was interesting about Pittsburgh this past week is the offensive line looked way better than it's looked the rest of the season. Um, Villanueva was destroying people in the run game, just murdering guys, and mm-hmm. had like pancakes all over the place. That was the best Marquise Pouncey I think I've ever seen. He actually looked like the Pro Bowl, All-Pro type center that everybody's always pointed him out to be. Um, to Castro is as good as he's been all season long, which is the best guard in the league so far. If that offensive line is rolling like that, that makes things a lot easier for Le'Veon Bell, who was back to being Le'Veon Bell, who mm-hmm. was able to use that um, hesitant style, the kind of patient stuff behind the line of scrimmage. It did open up runs, and he was uh, he broke ten tackles, I think, in that game. He was just getting a huge amount of yardage by himself after those holes opened up. So. If that Steelers offensive line plays as well as that this week against the Bengals, I think that will go a long way towards kind of blunting that Cincinnati defense and actually letting them get something done on offense. 
But same thing, they had as good a run game as you can possibly imagine. Only 19 points. It didn't lead to oh, yeah. incredibly productive offense. So, I like I said, I'm picking the Bengals. You guys, I think, are picking the Steelers. The Steelers. We'll see how it goes uh, Sunday. On to the Broncos, who travel to L.A. to face the Chargers. Chargers favored by a point and a half in this one, if you can get the line, because uh, Trevor Simeon still maybe a little banged up with the shoulder. Uh, and I'm going to go with the Chargers, though, because I pick them every week, and this is the time <laughs> that they pay off for me. They, they, they are the team that I thought that the past few weeks they've looked like they are who we thought they were. Well, that was that's my excuse. Yeah. That, that's what I keep asking Sam on every pod. When does your preseason when can I expectation <laughs> like when? But like when, when does it run wrong? out? Like when do you just be like I was completely wrong? Yeah. Or when do you revert back? And the Chargers are starting to revert back to we thought that they were going to be good. The Simeon thing though, I just think there are certain teams that are bad matchups. The more you watch him, it's those two high cover two cover. Uh, Zach and I call them the two you know, the two four six teams mm-hmm. PFF terms. You cover two four and six. Split safeties. Were you missing it up? Yeah, exactly. Thank you for explaining it so simply. Your <laughs> split safety teams. So that was the Giants. Yeah. Last week he struggled. It was the Bills a few weeks ago. He struggled. The Chargers are the opposite. They're more Cheers. a single high team and he'll have more one on one opportunities. So I think there might be a bounce back from Simeon here. Mm-hmm. But I still like the way the Chargers are trending back toward what we thought they were. And the Broncos also kind of trending back toward what we thought they were because we called for this regression. Both sides of the ball had some question marks. I think we're starting to see. Yeah, that. Trevor Simeon is just not not a quarterback who's going to protect the ball every game. He, he is a guy who will put the ball in harm's way a good deal. And that's why I didn't think that he was a good that this offense was going to be that good. And I thought it was a team that wasn't going to be contending for a playoff position before the season. But if he like if he can protect the ball against the Chargers, like you you like the Broncos' chances then when that's the case. Also, this Chargers team and their revival, mm-hmm. it's it's by beating what was a winless Giants team at the time okay. and getting 17 points against a terrible Oakland defense, which it turns out was good enough to win that game because Derek Carr is terrible this year. I don't know that they're quite that good at this point, um, despite a two-game hey, winning games? streak. They did. They won those games. I'm just yeah, questioning how impressive a feat that was. I'm pretty impressed. Yeah? I was <laughs> very impressed. Uh, I don't know, though. The Chargers offense, Phillip Rivers still looks like, even with a little improved offensive line, it looks like we're not really ever going to see the guy we saw back in, I don't know, since like 2011. He just is, I don't think he's ever going to get back to that form. I think all those guys are physically just, yeah, on the way lost. down. Yeah. It it's is. our weekly thrashing of the 2004 yeah. <laughs> draft like, class. Let's call them all done. They're all done. Eli right? has been a little bit better. Now he's done. Than we expected. Yeah, yeah, but everything else around him sucks, so we can still call him done. Rivers still, still you know, anticipation, dig route, and a couple corner. He still had some some big time throws BTT. that led them to victory down the stretch. I don't have as much faith in Philip Rivers either, but right situation, you know, right week, he can still get it done. Mike Williams was back last week. He's should be playing more this week. We'll see if that makes an impact. Uh, I'm picking the Chargers, though. Did we all take the Chargers? Did we all jump off Denver's bandwagon here? Uh, no. I've Same. gone Denver. Has gone Denver. Mm. They've already won once against the, the Chargers. The home road thing doesn't work here because I don't think the Chargers have any kind of home field they advantage do not. here. Uh, <laughs> no. Whatsoever. On to the Seahawks, who travel across the country to New York to face the Giants. Seahawks, four and a half point favorites in this one. I already bet the Giants line uh, because that seems like way too many points against a legitimate the Giants still have a good defense. The Seahawks still have the worst offensive line in football. This is still a an East Seahawks Coast offense game. That, yeah, it's they're still traveling across the country, and the Seahawks offense just is a liability at this point. <laughs> a straight liability. They I still have Russell Wilson. I know it's still have Russell pressure. Wilson, but it's liable. Oh, Sam, do you have your Russell Wilson number handy that we did have dug up for us? The pressure? No, uh, no, I don't. Well, your theory was essentially proven right. I need the exact numbers on it, but uh, when he gets pressure, what, 40% of the time? 45% of the time. If it's over 45% of the time, he's bad Russell Wilson. If it's under 45% of the time, he's good Russell Wilson, mm. basically. That, I think that's every quarterback in the NFL, though. Yeah, but the no, line is specific. The, okay. the kind of the 45% area. Like any, any quarterback who's getting pressured more than 45% of the time is always going to struggle because that's just a yeah. horrible amount of pressure. But Wilson is always hovering around that time because mm-hmm. the offensive line is so bad. So it's, it's a very specific kind of area for him that 
you know, when that line can buy him just a little bit of time over the course of a game to get below 45, yeah. you get the really good Russell Wilson that looks like an MVP candidate. And then when it, when it has, when it just the regular offensive line shows up and they just get torn to pieces, you get over 45%, and Wilson just has those games where it looks like they're never going to score. I loved watching this Giants defense the other night. That did feel like last year where they had so many games where they just made life so difficult on quarterbacks. Every throw was challenged. And that's what it felt like against Denver. Even the even a lot of the completions were just tight window throws, had to be perfect, you know, from you know, Eli Apple playing well to Landon Collins flying around, Janoris Jenkins. I mean, uh, you know, Jenkins got picked on a little bit and you know made some plays, gave some up, but I just en- I enjoyed watching that defense challenging every throw. I think they will make it difficult on Seattle's offense. So Jason Pierre-Paul remembered that he was a good player uh, this week. Now, granted, that was going up, first of all, against Menelik Watson, and then Menelik Watson's backup at right tackle for, yes. for Denver. So that's going to help. But that's not going to get... Th- th- yeah, that's not going to disappear when they go against the Seahawks. We just talked about having one like of the worst exacerbated. offensive lines out there. Yeah. So... You should. I mean, if that was the reason, if if it was a case of Jason Pierre-Paul just hadn't faced a terrible offensive tackle yet, he's going to get another one this week. So we should see good Jason Pierre-Paul. More JPP. Again. Yeah, I'm going Giants. Like I am picking the Giants to win. Back Are you to the back lone games. wolf on that though? There's a lot of lone, lone wolf, wolf games. He is. But I just think that they. I just don't. I, I think it's another one. Close game, low scoring. I'll go with the home team. Yeah, I I think I agree. I think it'll be close game, low scoring, but I, Seattle are just better than the Giants right now. I'm, I'm this is still, fascinating. They were you know un, they were winless until this past week. And That's true. Somehow, they were winless. Somehow pulled a game out of the bag against Denver with no logic whatsoever backing it up. So seven lone wolf games. I'm not expecting it to reverse mm-hmm. itself this week. We have a lot of unanimous ones on PFF. Seven lone wolf games this week. This is one of yours, Mike. One of my lone wolves. I'm going Giants. With the Giants. And don't forget our boys uh, Eric and George will be here to give their their lock of the week later on. Lock of the week. Uh, let's keep it moving to the Falcons who travel to New England for the Patriots. Have these teams played each other before? I, mean, I can't remember. Uh, Patriots Not are favored by no. three uh, in this one. That was... They covered the la- that spread the last time these two teams played. Uh, Steve, break it down. Is it... An, is it is it going to go the exact same way as we saw the last time? I bet it doesn't go the exact same way as it did the last I time. Don't, it could, though. That's the crazy thing. I don't think it's going to go Atlanta jumping out to that type of lead. Uh, you know, Atlanta's offense, A lot. Of, it's time to start maybe questioning a little bit about the Atlanta's offense. I, I, last week I kept saying, look, Matt, it's a lot of it's on Matt Ryan just not playing as well. Uh, played a little bit better on Sunday, didn't show up on the stat sheet, but I think ultimately he'll start making more throws and doing what he needs to do. And I don't know what you guys are smirking at over <laughs> here, but nothing. Uh, I, the is it time to be concerned though about the Falcons' offense? Like you mentioned, they went up against the Dolphins, didn't score a point in the second half. That just seemed that'd be unfathomable uh, a season ago for them to disappear no, in the I second know. half, right? I just don't think that they're no, as I'm bad. Sure. They're not as bad. That's another Super Bowl throwback joke. Uh, but uh, are they like wow? <laughs> poor Falcons fans. They're all going to turn this thing off. Uh, no, are they? But like, is it what? What is the is it just that they lost Kyle Shanahan, or are there other issues with this offense beyond that? I really think it's Matt Ryan. You know, he's played. He is. A, he's always been an above-average quarterback, a top six, eight, ten quarterback every single year of his career. Last year, top three, right? Mm-hmm. He's playing middle of the road type of football for the most part. Just jumped back up into our top ten this past week. So up until this point, he's played pretty much mid-tier football. And that's just not him. So I do expect more games like Sunday, which, again, didn't show up in the stat sheet, but he played better, had that beautiful deep post, uh, start to make a few more throws and just not miss the throws that he usually hits. And I think that offense will be fine. They're never. I don't think they're getting back to last year's level. I mean, that was the preseason expectation. You lose Kyle Shanahan. All of their playmakers around Julio may have overachieved, and Matt Ryan kind of raised his game as well. So I don't think they get back, but it, one of these days they're going to explode again and, and be a very good offense i just that's what i think what do you I, think I was, mike i just worry about i thought it would have happened at this point if that were the case is all i'll say i just think there is like there are well, i mean the other way of looking at this is that last season was 
quite an anomaly for that offense. I mean, it was good the year before, but we weren't expecting last season's offense to be the best offense in the NFL. It kind of came out of nowhere. Oh, it was definitely an anomaly. And and blew up. So they're probably closer to their baseline of what they should be than they were a season ago. You know, this is probably closer to what this Falcons team should be on offense um, than last year was. Last year was just catching lightning in a bottle, and that's probably, you know, it's not going to happen again. I don't know if it's going to get much better than this. I think this is probably what we're looking at for this Falcons offense. We may see a little bit more um, production from them, but I, I mean, it's not going to be one of the league's best offenses anymore. There's some, there's somewhere in between these last couple of years, though, because 2015, everybody's like, hey, what's wrong with Matt Ryan? He's got a million interceptions, only an 89 passer rating. Just from pure stat standpoint, that's not that good in the NFL. That's like about average in the NFL these days. What's wrong with Matt Ryan? We were reassuring people Matt Ryan is fine. And then last year, off the charts numbers, ridiculous MVP type numbers, and we're saying, whoa, 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 Matt Ryan's not as good as these numbers are showing. And there's somewhere in between that whole th- whole thing. Right now, it's looking more like two years ago, at least statistically, 2015. It'll be better. He'll creep back toward you know that upper echelon of quarterback. I was gonna I say he's going to have some time to throw. I would imagine against this Patriots front four. Uh, if he, is this the game he puts it back together against the Patriots? Is going to be a shootout, Steve? I mean, this, to your point, you know, get the, the Patriots defense allows some longer developing routes and some more downfield opportunities. I do think Ryan will have a lot of success moving the ball. Uh, I think I think with the Patriots defense, you'll start seeing them kind of uh, clamp down in the red zone a little bit more like they have historically. And so I think that's what the New England defense ultimately becomes in the second half. That team that's going to give us some yards and but, you know, maybe make it, you know, in a uh, a game where they're they're not really controlling the game, but if they make just enough stops, that's what this this game kind of feels like. Yeah, I I pick I pick the Patriots. I do trust the Patriots offense far more than I trust Atlanta's offense at this point. And I still come back to they have too much talent in that front in that secondary to just be playing the way they've played. And right, I, I think, think they'll, it, they'll be it, better. It, it start, yeah, it's starting to balance out the last two weeks with the Bucks and the Jets. I think they played a little uh, uh, Jet scoring. <laughs> What they did score was actually probably bad, but still. Plus the extra I, I think touchdown. It, yeah. Plus the touchdown that didn't count. Uh, no, with the Atlanta, without Vic Beasley, last year's sack leader, actually creating more pressure this year on a person that basis. Oh, no, don't do that. You spreading are the wealth. Busting the narrative. They're spreading the wealth. There's five guys over 77.6 in mm. PFF pass rush but grades. The so they're much heads. more well-rounded defensive front the talking heads have assured me that atlanta's problem is not having vic beasley on the field oh yeah are you telling me that's not the case the defense is pretty good Deion jones making all those athletic plays at linebacker and desmond trufant's back and playing well uh robert alford kind of struggling a little bit so something to keep an eye on there but yeah atlanta's defensive front sam the talking heads they're wrong oh wow all right i picked new england sam yep same we all took new england all took the winning it all right on to the last game of the week the redskins traveled to philadelphia to face the 5-1 and one Eagles. Eagles favored by five points in this game. Are the Eagles the team to beat in the NFC? Sam. Yeah. Break I it think down. So. I mean, we've, we talked before. This, this Eagles team, they're a bit like the Jaguars in terms of every single year. We were kind of expecting them because of that roster on paper to be really good, and they kept letting us down. And this was the year most people jumped off that bandwagon. I'm led to believe you were never on it in the first place, so you're okay. Which bandwagon is this? This Eagles oh, preseason them, hype oh, train. I was 100% on that bandwagon. Were you? I wrote that they're the team, they're going to be the most improved team in the NFC. Oh, okay. So, but you've been, you haven't been on it before, is what I'm saying. Oh, no, yeah. I always pick a, uh, yeah. I, did, I didn't pick them last year. So most people have been on that before. This was the year that they're actually coming true because they fixed the wide receiver issue. You know, the yes. offensive line, probably the best offensive line in the league this year. Carson Wentz looks so much better off the back of that. Carson Wentz being better has meant that Nelson Aguilar is revived. He's not a bust better anymore. better out of the slot. Far, far better out yeah, of the slot. Yeah, and out of the slot as well. Yep. Alshon Jeffrey is helping as well. So the offense is, is fixed. You know, their problem is they had no receivers before. Now they have receivers. They've got a quarterback playing well. They're big on third downs. The defense has always had a really tough front seven, but they haven't been able to stop anybody on the back end. We thought that that was going to be resolved by um, the trade for Ronald Darby. Darby goes down. It looks like that's going to be a problem again. At the moment, it's kind of being held together by the play of Patrick Robinson, which is <laughs> yeah, kind of come out of nowhere. But as long as that holds up, they're in pretty good shape because like Jalen Mills is getting relentlessly targeted, but he's doing okay given how much they're throwing at him. So if, if Robinson stays anywhere near this level of play, 
the defensive front is so good that they're able to hold up with everything else. If Robinson regresses badly and we start seeing bad Patrick Robinson come out again, then I think you've got much more problems because suddenly you can light up that secondary and it doesn't really matter how much pressure they're going to get because you can just pass the ball over their heads. But until that happens, I think this is the best team in the NFC. Yeah, how smart do we look for calling the Eagles the number one line heading into the season? We took a lot of flack We for still that. do from they Eagles do. fans. And we are Blunt's averaging 5.6 yards. Per, like, they are... From Eagles fans. They, are, they were so <laughs> mad yeah. that we said that their offensive they line are, was good. They legitimately are dominating pretty much every front they go against. And they're going up against the front in the Redskins who... Without Jonathan Allen for the rest of the year, oh, that's such a which is yeah, that kills me. But that, that also kills the Redskins defense because it had been an imp- they had, I'd say, outperformed expectations up front. Everyone remembers how they dominated that Oakland line uh, in prime time. But without Jonathan Allen, you just you take going to take a little bit of a step back. Yeah, you got you you really would have wanted him in this game. Huge loss. It's still you know, going to Washington for a second in their offense and. You know, Kirk Cousins has played a little bit better the last few weeks, at least statistically, off the charts statistically. Uh, he's still in a big prove-it mode for me. You know, I still don't know what Kirk Cousins is. Or or if he... Rich. He's very rich. <laughs> he's very rich. He's franchised multiple times. Uh, it's, it's a huge prove-it game for him because even in the years where he has been good statistically, it's been, all right, last year, the game's on the line. Playoffs are on the line. We're going up against Carolina didn't really play a great game you know so he's this is one of those games and one of those weird you know rematches already i mean don't we kind of know seven. exactly what kirk cousins is the problem is it isn't it just isn't what you're comfortable handing 70 million dollar contract to well no because here's the thing whether it's on him or not the end result the stats and uh, i'll keep ending up really really good mm-hmm and so like pff grades aren't working out great other metrics aren't working out great the end results working out great so it's either they are that much better at scheming, they have these incredible playmakers, or or there is something to what he's doing there. And so I'm either just waiting for him to kind of match up with the grades a little bit more, which is a, a regression that needs to happen, or maybe he is the guy because he keeps getting the job done as far as just pure moving the ball well, the other and making plays. Even when you're playing badly, you're going to put up a lot of numbers. You know what I mean? Like you can you can put up some impressive looking cumulative statistics. I'm not talking about yards. I'm just talking about avoiding games. interceptions. And he is taking care of the ball overall a little bit better. And he's playing better in the red zone now after a disastrous week one against Philadelphia. He was terrible in the red zone, which is what killed him last year. Terrible red zone interception. He's been much better over these last few weeks. I know. I'm just saying that there's ways you can warp the statistics without actually playing that well. Um, and part of that is what he's benefiting from but i think kirk cousins is a good not great quarterback and he's gonna have stinking games every now and again and the eagles defensive front is good enough that they are going to make most quarterbacks start to look like the worst version of themselves we saw it last week with cam newton that was the worst cam newton you're gonna see i think we're probably gonna see exactly what they did to kirk cousins again in week one we're gonna see the worst version of kirk cousins come out because he's going to be under pressure all of the time and that week one he was under pressure 20 times over the course of the game, 20 of 47 dropbacks. And when he was, he completed just 40% of his passes through for just 67 yards and a passer rating of 48.5. So when the Eagles bring that amount of pressure on you, there's not much you can do about it. Yeah, the Eagles should be fully healthy along that defensive line. Jernigan and Fletcher Cox should be playing. And then on the flip side, though, Washington going to be without Josh Norman most likely and could be without Bashad Breland. Which at that point it's like no, top a, two corners. Any team's gonna, any, any defense is gonna struggle without their top two corners. I don't see, I just can't see how the Washington Fletcher the Cox win this game. destroyed Trey Turner last week. Like Trey Turner is a good right guard, right into Cam, leading to the uh, ball popped Not out just for a the good, interception, but a powerful right guard. And Fletcher Cox drove him back like it was you trying to block that was, him. That was great. I could probably block Flip. I would, I would cut him. Yes, you would have to cut him. It's a long way quick, down to quick. cut, though. I might be trouble. <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think, think he'd hold up well against. Fletcher I'm not sure Cox. he'd be quick enough to even get down there before he <laughs> picks you up. Steve, so Philadelphia is pretty legit. <laughs> We're all taking Philly. Yeah, I'm taking Philly. It's a five point spread. I might even, at the end of the day, take them to cover that one. So that is it for us, though. We previewed all the games except for maybe Thursday Night Football. We might miss that, but we oh, previewed. So you didn't preview the first one. And I, yeah, suspended. I didn't preview the Bucks. If you want my takes on the Bucks Bills, well, just uh, look okay. me up on Twitter. I'll give you some takes. Uh, I'm always down to give takes. But yeah, follow me on Twitter, PFF underscore Mike. PFF underscore Sam and PFF underscore Steve. That's it for us. We'll talk to you again next week.